So hi, I'm Sven. Uh, I'm the data scientist at Wildcard. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we borrowed a trick from deep learning to actually do, I guess, what you could call cheap learning as well. Um, so um, my background is that I'm a physicist. Um, and this is like Wildcard is my first real world experience. Um, so I started last October and joined the offices there in January. And uh, just last month, uh, we launched our app. And you can go and download it. It's kind of a distributed demo. Um, so just go to the App Store, download the app. Um, we were the best new app last month. And uh, we are hiring more people. So um, where have you? Wildcard is a startup that's been around for a bit. It didn't start just a year ago. It started like at the very beginning of 2013. Um, the mission statement is kind of to develop technologies for future native mobile web experience through cards. And um, we are a very design-driven company, so all these like words really come from our designers and how they think about our product. Um, so card is really more like a product term than a technical term, and it just means that the UI paradigm for how we think about a mobile web is based on cards. And um, we, our task is to structure uh, mobile web content to represent in these cards. So in addition to um, making an iOS app, we also uh, were working on, an, on a partner program where we work together with publishers um, to make these cards through direct interfaces to them. Um, we also had an SDK program um, that kind of created more like of an ecosystem of cards so that we can also distribute these cards. And all this was originated that the first version of Wildcard um, was a browser. So this was the, like the original statement was, we want to create a browser that kind of replaces browsing information on mobile devices. And uh, we attacked this by verticals. And the first vertical, or now, the first vertical was shopping. Um, and now we pivoted a bit to just do um, news first and uh, kind of keep working on this broader mission of Wildcard. So what is the actual machine learning part? So when you click on an article in the Wildcard app right now, you see the web view. Um, you see the full page that the publisher gives us. Um, and what you didn't see here, that this took about a few seconds to load, versus if you click this button, um, view as card, on the very bottom of this page, um, you get taken to a card view, and um, which is our extracted version of the content on that page. Um, and that view is pretty much instantaneous. So that's about all I want to say about our app. Um, now to the part that kind of was my task to build. So there's a microservice end, uh, endpoint um, in our stack that takes in a URL to any news article. And it returns you some JSON that is the structured information from this page. So it's a search box-like interface. You just have very simple, just one URL. And you get some structured information back. And of course, also a REST API for this. So because we're coming from a browser background, we wanted this to be fairly general. So this was not just built for news articles. We want this to be also to be applied to um, other kinds of product pages. So that's why we still have some like slides here where we do the product sets and to buy individual products or like locate a store, things you want to do when you walk around with your phone. Um, but for now, the current app is mostly um, news. So let me walk you through how we started this. So at the very beginning, you create a data set. So we went out and uh, just loaded in some news articles um, and then had our analysts um, use a custom tool um, to label certain things in these uh, data sets. Um, I call this a kind of um, hybrid approach because those are web pages. There's a lot of markup content in web pages already. And so we only need to ask our analysts for the pages where this content is missing. So titles are pretty well marked up in news articles. Everything else is a bit harder. Um, so let me just skip to the next thing. Um, these are kind of how the tools look like. Um, we do um, in our input data set, we have three versions of every web page. We have a plain get request. We have the version of the web page as it would look like on a desktop. And we have it on how it would look like on a phone. So here, 
we could have done the simple thing, but um, the idea is you get as much data as possible and then rather use simpler algorithms. Um, so what our analysts do is they label either directly kind of the DOM tree and kind of mark that up directly if we only have information about, if we only have the plain get request. But we also do um, a fully emulated um, desktop version of the page. And so there we can ask in the browser when this page was shown to a user um, where, where are exactly the rendered coordinates of every page element. And was the font size of this page element larger than the font size of the title? Um, so we have all these interesting features just from putting a bit more work into um, scraping these web pages. Um, another thing that came out of this is uh, this is how our kind of tree-based labeler um, looks like, that we have a um, leaderboard here uh, between our analysts um, so that we can see who's kind of faster or who is more accurate. Um, just having this also shown to the analysts was a nice experience for us because they actually in this room, tried to do it the fastest and got a lot more done. Um, we had actually bad experiences with this labeler to do this because this one has a pretty difficult user interface. Um, this one, that is based on the emulated pages, um, is a lot easier, um, more intuitive to use, and so this is where it worked really well. So, um, what you saw there, this photo was like from our offices where our analysts used it and we kind of did an in-house usability test kind of um, before we had our offshore team use these tools and we learned a lot from just looking over the shoulders of our own analysts using these tools for the first time. So it's kind of the really cheap version of doing usability testing. Um, but it taught us a lot and it taught us, for example, that we never deployed this other labeler um, offshore yet. So building up to kind of um, the machine learning part, um, Let's talk about the features that we have available at this point. So um, this is a very hybrid data set. So if you're coming from like more like a deep learning perspective, you have like lots and lots of features, but they're all the same type. They're all just like pixel values or something like that. So what we have here is uh, a lot of different types of features. Um, so text properties are kind of in a range and kind of topological, if you want to think about it like this, different than if you have like bags of words model for certain words or if you have like just uh, like a, a vectorizer for an HTML tag. And then optionally, um, we built a separate uh, classifier to work with all the visual information that we could extract if we wanted to, to increase our accuracy. So talking about the pipeline, um, we have a data set at this point. Um, we do our parallelized do our parallelized document processing um, using Apache Spark. Just had a great presentation about this. Um, so we, do, we even, so we, we refactored this uh, two months ago. Um, we didn't used to have this, but now that we switched to Apache Spark, we basically integrated the entire pipeline into Spark before we had like separate processes that went out in crawl pages. Um, now we do this all in one shot in Spark, um, which yeah, it meant that we had to configure our like EC2 instances where we deploy Spark that they have the necessary third-party apps, uh, PhantomJS or things like that, to actually emulate web pages installed on these boxes. Um, then we construct these features um, for labeled data sets. We aggregate all these data sets, join them together, whether we have like analyst labels, we have uh, um, other meta tag extractors um, to label our data, and then we also apply some filtering. So. We need about the same processing pipeline that we do to our like large number of training and test data sets. We need the same on this microservice endpoint that I talked about that our platform is gonna to talk to. So for if you as a user require a single page, um, a process gets kicked off and asks a microservice in our stack to return a result. So um, that endpoint needs to do the exact same transformations on a document before it becomes a normalized feature set. and. Uh, so this is where I invested, invested some time and wrote kind of uh, an interface compatible version of Spark in pure Python. So you do have now uh, a Spark context and an RDD without the JVM, but it's highly non-parallel. It's very fast, uh, it does require very little resources, but you cannot apply to 100,000 documents. You just apply to a single one and it works with very little resources. Um, we also abstracted kind of the file IO from this process as it would be in Spark. 
So you have in Python this file IO module that can access your files on S3, HTTP, HTTF, HTFS, so that the same process when you um, train it on a cluster, you can run the same thing locally on your laptop, and all these different backends don't really matter. Um, what we do is um, we don't use Spark MLlib. Um, we use uh, scikit-learn classifiers, um, simply because we do want to run it on an endpoint that doesn't actually have a JVM installed. So we also used uh, this particular uh, tool in our evaluation tools. Um, same reason, they're, run they're running on pretty small machines. Um, and we can just point uh, high sparkling to these large data sets, but if we say, just give me a random record, um, it's evaluated lazily and it does this really well. Um, and we also use it in some like data set preparation tools. So coming back to um, the pipeline, the, the last part of the pipeline, kind of once we come close to the machine learning part, is um, that we use uh, single machine random forests. Um, Andreas Muller, who is kind of the release manager of scikit-learn, said in a talk recently that 256 gigabyte ought to be enough for anybody for machine learning. Um, he motivated that by this is kind of the largest EC2 instance that you can currently get, and it's still a lot cheaper than a data scientist. So kind of the generalization of that is at any given point, whatever the largest EC2 instance is, that memory should be enough for you. Um, I think that covers actually a lot of use cases, probably not all of them, certainly not all of them, um, but for kind of the startup world doing a small project, this is definitely enough for us, and it uh, allows us to have a lot of freedom, and we're gonna talk about how we use that. Um, okay, so kind of when we refactored this, kind of draw out a little diagram how we internally organize this now, so uh, we have basically four operations that we do, we train, we test, we validate, and then we actually use it in production. And uh, the first three we use on our Spark cluster, and it's an offline process. And then what comes out of that is a scikit-learn classifier, roughly. And uh, we use that one on a very small box that runs um, just a Python interface. So let's go to the machine learning part. So the input is a document, like one HTML page, and the output is this is the title, this is the author, this is the date, and here is the body of the article. Um, if you have this kind of problem, so we saw it actually this morning, a cheat sheet, so this is also cheat sheet for scikit-learn. Um, you start, you go through this path, and you end up with predicting structure, tough luck. And this is exactly where we are with this problem. Um, so I spoke to a couple of people how to attack this problem, and we're gonna walk you through now how we didn't kind of use anything that uh, is the standard here for, ver uh, for various reasons. So um, normally for structured learning, you would go to conditional random fields. Um, we knew that we needed like a higher order um, information from neighbors, so we didn't only need the direct neighbor information in a conditional random field, we needed the six order neighbor and then they're really bad, so for people who know what it is, that's why we decided not to use it. Um, well, let's say we just start with the simplest thing that we can do, and that was great advice that I got early on in this project, is, okay, this kind of structured learning is really complicated, but um, let's do the very simple thing, and let's do it kind of as fast as possible, and uh, worry about all the other things that come up in a startup where it's like, you need to spin up your own microservice and you write your own chef script and you write your own Docker files. So let's, let's get to a state first where you do something and then iterate from there. So we settled on a very simple um, first approach um, that we needed here is just, let's extract some blocks of the page and let's classify them individually. So that was the architecture that I sh just showed you. Um, we use plain scikit-learn random forest and we do like a 11 class classification of every element on the page. What's of course really important, and that doesn't include that, is information about that your neighboring element is an author is very important for the title. Um, same as uh, if you know before there was a navigational element, it's also very important for the title. And then you have the other problem of every other element on the page should know about where the title is so that it knows whether it's before the title, after the title, or um, 
as I mentioned before, what its relation is in terms of like, is its font size smaller or larger than the title's font size? So there's a couple of, this problem has been done before um, many times. Um, so there's approaches where you first say, let's, let's write a really good method first for throwing away sidebars, or let's write a really good method first for throwing away ads or comments. Um, with most of these me methods, once you've figured something out there, um, you then immediately see that you also need the other information that comes later on to inform your first process, and you get into the same loop that was your problem originally. So there are these te text density-based um, methods where they just work for articles, um, but mostly for really long-form articles, where you just look at where's the majority of your text on the page um, in relation to how many tags do you have. So navigations are little text, a lot of divs inside divs inside divs inside UL elements, whatever. Um, then there's a um, method that's just say, you find your, your body elements by clustering um, your paragraphs on the page. Clustering is interesting here, but it also points out two problems with this, that um, you have ads in between that kind of screw up your clustering, or you cannot cluster two different things. Um, and I'm gonna show you how this method here kind of uh, really nicely handles this. And then um, we have uh, like conditional random fields, and there is the problem that the complexity, how to handle them, how to train them, um, comes really bad. So what we want here is a single step algorithm. And um, what we did here was really, what I showed there is we, um, we just do a guess um, to the zero's order. And then we generate hypotheses of modifications of this guess and see whether a global objective function of the documents improves. So this is kind of a, a sampling approach that is in a very similar to conditional random fields. But we just define a global hypothesis that says this is what all your elements are. And then we have an objective function, and then we can like sample, walk, whatever, through the space um, if we have a good proposal function, and then find a globally optimal configuration of these documents. So instead of having kind of loops of dependencies, um, we just globally define what everything is, and then we see how good we did and sample through that space. Um, that gave us pretty okay results. Um, it's kind of questionable how this really uh, works if you'd only train on a certain data set, and uh, your inference here is very slow because you have to do the sampling on every, on every document. So coming back to this kind of conditional random fields idea is that in deep learning, and when people do scene descriptions, um, they do this with like scene graphs. So basically what happens there is you, you take a street and pe what people used to do is, uh, or I think still do, um, is to, to group certain uh, pixels together by their luminosity, for example. And only once they're grouped together, they define relationships in a graph and then um, kind of classify the nodes of the graph. And uh, so what people did in like 2011 um, around Jan LeCun's Kuhn, group, so Clement Parabé um, did this. Um, they just uh, kind of applied a classification algorithm to every pixel in that image um, that can be parallelized very nicely. Um, and in a deep neural network, that's also really fast. Um, so they had an almost, I would call almost real time approach here to label these pixels in real time. So what you see here that all these colored images in the left here and the top there have little labels that says this is the street, this is a tree. And they have videos of that where it's doing this pretty fast. So this is a traditionally a conditional random fields problem. And uh, they did this with deep learning. So what can we do here? Um, kind of we kind of did the same thing. We inverted kind of um, the sampling problem and just did a forward um, propagation of the information. And uh, as we have our initial guess of what all the elements are, we have a separate kind of guess afterwards um, that takes into account what the neighbors of the previous step were. And then we repeat that. So um, we have two types of classifications here, but they're very general. Um, it does find out whether um, all these kind of clustering behaviors of other algorithms um, we see here too. So if your neighbor is an author, your classification in the second step uh, prefers that too. Um, and then we iterate this step until it settles down to a stationary state. And then what I actually don't show here is that we have another layer here that 
does a different kind of classification with uh, different types of features that kind of kick you out of local minimas and then goes back to this iteration and uh, keeps classifying this. So this is kind of in deep learning, people notice that as you go through the layers, it is also kind of an optimization procedure at every layer. It's kind of an optimization step. Um, and here I'm trying to do a similar thing. So in practice, um, with this step, we saw the processing time drop by a factor of 10. Uh, once we deployed this method, this feed forward, we didn't see any degradation in our quality. And uh, given that we are still in the kind of like standard scikit-learn random foresty uh, machine learning field, um, we were still um, very fast in kind of iterating on um, our uh, models. So that was that. Um, I just want to point out kind of as an experience working in a startup, what is like things that your CEO notices um, that, that those are usually not test scores. Um, your CEO as a single person doing this project doesn't expect you to be better than people who've done this for a long time. <coughs> so you work on other things and those are like for your company um, very particular problems that might be nice for us. And if you can make an algorithm that does similar things that, and then others, but then also keeps part of the media content. So we had our editors complain that some of the articles just miss all the images. Turned out these images were actually Instagram embeds. And uh, the other algorithms that we used before um, didn't take Instagram embeds over. And uh, so if you put a little bit of time here, that's not a machine learning task, it's a pure engineering task, but you can say um, your endpoint supports this. Um, this is very nice for the company. So we have a lot of uh, news articles that currently are written by um, collecting kind of social media when, for example, a train crash happens. We have so many smartphones um, present that this article is written very quickly. And then another thing that we do is enabling domains that require JavaScript. This is also kind of uh, difficult for a lot of other algorithms that we use. Um, then um, we, we also then work kind of uh, publisher by publisher through to improve uh, our performance and then enable them one by one. And this is something like extremely preliminary, but we compared it uh, last week to uh, kind of other methods that we have and um, we are very compatible to, compatible to them. Um, so our performance with this method is really good. Um, kind of, we don't publish this data set, so it's kind of an unfair comparison, but uh, we'll work on this in the future and probably we will. So I walked you through kind of an entire pipeline of machine learning, how kind of what's achievable in like a kind of longish uh, few months uh, time frame. So um, we build a data set, we build a processing pipeline, we build features, we build labeling tools, and um, then came up with an inference strategy that actually works fast and is fast enough. Um, we chose tool that allow us quick iteration. So we used parallel tools to um, do kind of the simple feature extraction task and then to be more flexible, we do machine learning on a single note because we have more algorithms available for that and they're enough for us. Um, two open source projects came out of this. Um, please have a look at them and uh, send me comments. And then, uh, yeah, we're currently powering 54% of the cards in Wildcard, which is really nice.